Brixton, South London. Late night revelers are heading home. But a young man is being viciously beaten in the street. At the heart of this attack, Frederick Malfroy. He's sitting on top of the man, pummeling him. Malfroy was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for attempted GBH committed almost five years ago, but he's never seen the inside of a cell. After he was charged, he jumped bail. He's one of thousands of criminals on the run. My name is Mark Williams Thomas, and for 12 years I worked for Surrey Police. Now I'm going to turn detective again to hunt three fugitives. One covered up his role in the death of a little boy. One is a serial robber, and one is a violent thug. They are just three of thousands who jump bail or break their license conditions. The problem, as I'm about to find out, is that there are lots of fugitives, but not necessarily a lot of people looking for them. South End Police Station, 7 a.m. Two jobs this morning. First one is a recall to prison. A lady by the name of Nikki Ann Crocker. Before I start my pursuit, I'm going to see how the police do it. Sergeant Enderby and his team are hunting a wanted person. Let's go. The team hit the first address. Hello. It's the police. Do you want to come to the door, my friend? Hello. Good morning to you, Miss Crocker. Who, Nikki? Yes. She, she, she's been round here a couple of times, but... Uh, in what in what guise, sir, if you see what I mean? What, um... She's a friend of a friend. All right. What, of your daughter or something? Yeah, or... me and niece. She's okay. upstairs in bed. Okay, so you won't mind me coming in then, sir, no? No, you can come in if you Okay, like. thank you. There's no sign of Nikki Crocker, but they get a new phone number. How many numbers has she got then? <laughs> oh no, we've got another one number for her, but Thank you see. You got yeah, you see, number. what you're gonna do now though is ring her, aren't you, and say the old bill are coming round. No, I'm not. You I bet you are. No, I won't do that. Fifty P bet, yeah? Please don't, I won't do that. Promise? I promise you I won't. Promise. Do that. Crocker is wanted for recall to prison after breaking her license conditions. Her original offence was robbery. Hello, it's the police. Can you open the door, please? No sign of life. Second address, still no sign. Last year, almost 100,000 people either jumped bail or broke their license conditions and were recalled to prison. Not all go on the run, but many have to be caught. That burden falls on the police. But finding these wanted people is one of many jobs for Sergeant Enderby's team. He estimates he spends just 40% of his time on this type of work. Four unannounced visits, no crocker. This is the heart of the problem with criminals on the run. It requires good intelligence and immense resources to track down even the most artless dodger. Our job is that two hours we've not wasted because we've, we're still doing active police work, but it's not got any results, and um, we need to produce results to keep going. That's how we're judged, so it's difficult. But the first door we knocked on, we could have found her and somebody else, but you don't know that's going to happen. That's the, nature of, uh, that's the nature of the beast, but onwards and upwards. A frustrating morning ends with no fugitives caught. Crocker was finally captured five days later. A 
According to our research, very few forces commit dedicated resources to this problem. Only two forces out of 43 in England and Wales have teams concentrated solely on finding wanted people. Many forces get their neighbourhood teams to do this work, but it's one of many jobs. Do you want to let us in? As a result, some police chiefs admit to targeting only the most serious fugitives. We've had various approaches over the last uh, 30 years, particularly with warrants and outstanding bails. We've tried to divide them into A, B, C, so A for, a for priority and C for not so priority, but I mean, there, there are still a very substantial number of these cases. So you're really only taking the top of it with the A's and possibly some of the B's. And then if you come across somebody in the street who turns out to be wanted on bail, then you might deal with some of the C's. If forces are hunting only the most serious fugitives, that must leave plenty on the streets. Scanning the wanted pages of police websites gave me a sense of the type of criminals on the run. Murderers, rapists, and thugs like Frederick Malfoy. Described by police as one of the most brutal gang attacks ever caught on CCTV. He was part of this savage assault almost five years ago that left his victims seriously injured and too scared to press charges. This was a horrific attack. Four men, one with an iron bar, some pink kicking an innocent person on the ground. While four of his cohorts served prison sentences, Malfoy, a bouncer at the Fridge nightclub, jumped bail and is still at liberty. I tried to find out exactly how many defendants skipped bail last year. The government replied to a freedom of information request by informing me that more than 30,000 people were prosecuted last year for jumping bail. This figure is often quoted in the media, despite some scepticism. There's about um, somewhat over 500,000 people on bail in a 12-month period. And how many of them abscond? There is a, there's an official figure given for the number who uh, absconded, who were prosecuted, which uh, is 31,000 in the last year. Uh, many people question whether that is the total number who didn't turn up. Uh, and it's not really known what that figure is and the government doesn't take that much care to make that figure available. So I asked again. This time, I got a much larger and unreported figure, 83,500. That's the total number of people who jumped bail last year, not just those prosecuted. That's 12% of all defendants bailed, more than one in 10. And according to the Union of Probation Officers, many of them are only caught if they commit another crime. And the only way the police find them is if they're arrested again for another offence, because there just isn't time for police officers to be able to research where these people are. There just aren't enough police officers to go around. The government told us the police and courts take extreme care when making a decision on granting bail. Public safety is paramount and there are rigorous checks. The overwhelming majority of those bailed do not re-offend. Morning. But I found there were also issues with offenders breaking their licence conditions. Last year, 15,631 criminals broke the terms of their licence and were recalled to prison, including 111 criminals on a life sentence. I don't think the system comes anywhere near to protecting the public. It's patently obvious what should be done. If, if there are known offenders who've committed serious crimes, including violent crimes, they really should not be roaming the streets. The vast majority of offenders are successfully returned to prison, and in most cases, license and bail are crucial and effective tools in managing offenders and defendants, as well as controlling the prison population. But to understand why so many people go on the run and stay on the run, I'm going to try and track down three fugitives. In 2005, Yahya Hashem tried to cover up his role in the death of 11-year-old schoolboy, Liam Hannan. 
Police are appealing for witnesses today after an 11-year-old boy was killed by a hit-and-run driver near his Cricklewood home. Hashem ran over Liam as he crossed this road. Liam was trying to reach an internet cafe to finish his homework. He died almost immediately. I went into complete shock, just... I went numb, simply numb. Just all of a sudden he wasn't there anymore. Hashem was charged with perverting the course of justice, driving without due care and attention, and not stopping at an accident. But he never turned up for the trial and has been on the run ever since. If, if I bumped into somebody in the street, uh, I'd apologize for it. But for someone to, to do something like that, and then point the finger in the opposite direction is one thing, but you would think sooner or later, you would put your hand up and say, oh my God, I did do that. How is that possible? I know I'm getting fucking angry. Okay. I know I'm getting fucking fucking pissed off at the whole fucking thing. Peter's anguish underlines how victims suffer when criminals escape. Sorry, 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 sorry. Paddington Station, 2007, just before midnight. Ahmed Oled, high on the drug cat, leaves a train in pursuit of a man. He climbs across some bikes to attack him from behind. His victim, in the top corner of the screen, stumbles as Orled's punch breaks his jaw and detaches his retina. The victim's crime was to challenge Orled and his friends as they harassed passengers on a train. This is probably one of the, the most vicious um, assaults that I've seen on, on, on the railway. This guy needs to be punished you know, because he's a nasty, vicious individual. Whilst three of all its friends served prison sentences for their part in the attack, he jumped bail and hasn't been seen since. He was sentenced in his absence to five and a half years in a young offender's institution for violent disorder and GBH with intent. Ahmed Orled is my second target. Finally, Daniel Slater. He has 12 convictions for 25 offences since 2000. He was sentenced to three years in a young offenders institution with four on licence for robbery. He was recalled to prison after breaking the terms of his licence. He won't live at an approved address. He won't comply with supervision. And he won't reply to any requests for meetings. The police have been looking for him since June. Daniel leaves a criminal lifestyle. Um, he has connections to a number of other people within our borough that commit criminal acts of criminality, um, particularly severe acts such as burglary, which really blight the lives of our community and have a massive impact. So for us, we really want to remove him from our streets. But Slater has been mocking the police on Facebook. Through my pursuit of Slater, Orled and Hashem, I will understand how some criminals try almost anything to escape justice. They will cross borders, change names, use false addresses, and show little fear of the law. Still to come. Hello, is that Daniel Slater? Will Daniel Slater's vanity get the better of him? Hi, it's Andrea Bowen here from South Talent Models.
I'm pursuing convicted robber Daniel Slater. He's been on the run since June when he broke his license conditions. The thing about Daniel is that he's not particularly discreet. For example, he has a Facebook page which he regularly updates and that presents us with an opportunity. This is our honey trap, Sally Ann Hogan. This is our fake Facebook profile to befriend Slater. She's a fun-loving girl inspired by JLS and Cheryl Cole. Sure enough, he accepts our request to be friends and sent a sweet message. But now we're mates, we can see what he's been up to whilst on the run. Here he is posing next to some brand new cars. Outside a jeweler's, then there's a range of watches and even one of his friends with a gun. There is no suggestion he stole these goods, but it's a brazen pose and suggests little fear of the law. I think it's very clear that a lot of offenders simply don't fear the system. And it's not surprising if you think about it, because when they're given cautions, they consider that to be nothing. And so uh, it, it's, it's just a facet of uh, the attitude of many people who are regular offenders to the system. Meanwhile, bail jumper Ahmed Oled has a different attitude to life on the run. He turned fugitive three years ago after he was convicted of a vicious assault on a former US Marine. He had addresses in West Drayton and Sheffield. We would um, attend them addresses on a regular basis, so much so that we're virtually on first name terms with, with his mother and sister. I was convinced that he'd left the country, but whereabouts he went to, I, I, I didn't know. But I found Oled on Facebook. Just like Daniel Slater, he was a regular user. He changed his name to Ahmed Yassin. Sally Ann got in touch, posing as an old friend. Do you remember me? Even though he'd never seen her before, Oled thought he recognised her. Well, since I've looked at your pics, I can remember your face, but not from where, though. The start of a charming relationship. Through Sally Ann, we could see that Oled had fled to Djibouti, a small country in East Africa, and beyond the reach of British justice. He also got a new job, and clearly he has no shame. Because Oled, who was wanted in Britain for brutally assaulting a former Marine, was working at a US military base in Djibouti, Camp Lemania. The base hosts thousands of American troops. And before he became president, Barack Obama paid a visit. I, I think this can be a potential model for what we're going to be needing to do uh, in a range of ungoverned or undergoverned spaces uh, around the world. Four years after this visit, Oled was working in the bar on the base, serving troops, including Marines. I was very surprised about that, very surprised indeed. But, it, but again, it just goes to show his arrogance and think he, he can get away with it. Because obviously, you know, he's, albeit John being a, an ex-Marine, you know, he's, he's damaged him quite considerably and he, and, he, and he thinks it's okay to go and work with, with other Marines. It's a pity they didn't find out who he was, really. All he'd got the job through his subcontractor. He was interviewed by the military and passed security checks. A spokesman for Camp Lemonia told us they have now tightened their security as a result of our investigation. <laughs> Fellow bail jumper Yahya Hashem might also have slipped the country. In 2005, Yahya Hashem ran over schoolboy Liam Hannan and then tried to cover it up. According to witnesses in court, after hitting Liam, Hashem examined his body on the road before driving off. That evening, he went to a police station and told officers a silver car was responsible for the accident. But Hatcham went much further to avoid being caught. The day after the accident, he came to this garage. He asked a mechanic to replace the bumper and to wash the car thoroughly. 
Whilst Hashem was cynically covering up, Liam's parents were making a painful appeal for help. His mother spoke to me and she managed to get across the few words Liam was dead. Hashem was charged, but given unconditional bail, leaving him free to plan his escape. By the time of his trial, he was gone. He was sentenced to 18 months in his absence for perverting the course of justice. He's been on the run for four and a half years. I returned to his old neighborhood. Hello, sorry to trouble you. I'm Mark Williams Thomas from ITV, and we're making a program to try and locate the man that used to live in number 28. Mr. Hatcham. Only a few people would talk on camera, but all of his neighbors were aware of Hashem. They hadn't seen him though. I've gleaned quite a lot of information just by speaking to people in the street. We believe they put the house on the market and that may well have given him the money to go on the run. We know that he holds two passports. He holds a British and an Egyptian passport. And that we also believe that when he went on the run, he went back to Egypt. As soon as Hashem disappeared, the police made inquiries at all ports. But it was too late. The Ministry of Justice told us that it's the responsibility of judges to decide bail conditions, including the removal of passports. While Hashem apparently left for Egypt, his family might still be in Britain because I've found an old address for them in North London. The neighbours told me they have seen them very recently. Hello, mate. All right. Why don't you help me? I'm trying to find this guy. They come and go. Are they from me in Egypt? They are. Do you, would you have an address for them? Because they've been back recently, haven't they? A couple of months ago. <laughs> just learned that Hatcham still has very strong links to this community. His brother-in-law owns the two properties just over there, and his wife, who occasionally comes back from Egypt, comes back to collect the post from one of the houses. It's a strong lead, yet Hashem is just one of thousands who jump bail. According to our research, more than 80,000 defendants failed to turn up for court last year. More than 4,000 of them are wanted for violent and sexual offences, and many of them are still at large, according to the Union of Probation Officers. It's extremely frustrating for police officers and for probation staff who spend inordinate amounts of time uh, catching individuals and writing reports on them to have so many, tens of thousands, disappear into the ether. And we don't find very many. They only come to light if they're re-arrested for another offence and the police are able to find through the computer that they're on the run for jumping bail. People on bail are a constant source of crime. Last year, one in 10 offences was perpetrated by someone on bail, including 41 murders and 129 rapes. But the government says the overwhelming majority of those bailed do not re-offend. Meanwhile, I've had a great idea to catch the robber on the run, Daniel Slater. The photos on his Facebook page made me think he might be a bit vain. So I've set a trap. South Talent, the UK's newest modelling agency, with a website and Facebook page. Then I offered Slater his big break. He gave us a phone number. Hello, is that Daniel Slater? Hi, it's Andrea Bowen here from South Talent Models. I just wanted to have a quick chat with you about possibly doing a shoot next week. Um, as it happens, we've got a studio booked. Exactly, yeah, um, very straightforward, sort of straight on and then a few profiles. Yeah, it should be fun, it should be fun. It'd be good. And we can always give you a photo at the end of it. You know, you never know what might come of it, really. Excellent, Daniel. That's great news. Thank you ever so much. The big day. We have a studio. 
a model, a photographer, secret cameras. We just need a criminal. Hello? That message, please press one if you want to send a text to the person you are calling. Same message. But it's a no-show. Later, Slater posts on Facebook he's been sick with food poisoning. He'll never make it in fashion with that attitude. But we don't give up that easily. He's seen him, he's seen, he's seen. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone. I'm on the tail of convicted robber Daniel Slater. He's been on the run for three months. After studying several images from his Facebook page, I think I've made a breakthrough. This is the crucial address. I've got a number of photographs of Daniel on his Facebook page that show him outside a flat. And I think the flat is inside this complex. I also believe that when Daniel comes to South End, I think he comes to that flat and this is where he's been staying. The problem is that I don't know which flat and there are almost a hundred. But he has also revealed on Facebook he has got a new girlfriend. I understand they don't live together, so there must be a good chance they'll meet in South End at the weekends. We are so close. Slater is just one of thousands of criminals who break their license terms and are recalled to prison. The government points out that over 99% of them are successfully returned to prison, but that remaining 1% equates to 942 criminals at large right now, including 18 murderers and 42 sex offenders. The end game is also fast approaching in my pursuit of bail jumper Ahmed Oled. He escaped to Africa rather than face justice for his savage assault on an innocent man. But after three years on the run, he's back in London. Big mistake. Because Sally Ann, who's been wooing Oled on Facebook, always gets her man and is now the honey in my trap. Oh, I'm in London soon, possibly this week. You tell me where and when, and I'll be there, babe. 
Let's meet at Liverpool Street Station at 6pm. Friday night, central London. He's due to meet us in about an hour's time. We've been in contact with the police, so when he turns up, he's going to have a big surprise. The trap is baited. An actress is playing Sally Ann. She's surrounded by undercover officers. The appointed hour, no Orlid. 60 minutes later, he stands her up. But we're not done yet. Yahia Hashem is proving just as hard to pin down. He's been on the run for four and a half years after covering up his role in the death of schoolboy Liam Hannan. He's believed to have escaped to Egypt before he could stand trial. I've learned that his wife visits a London address to get post, but we don't know if they're still together. Now I've got evidence to suggest that Hashem himself returns to the capital. Duncan Mee is a private investigator for a company called Cerberus. They locate wanted people through their financial transactions. Every time we use a credit card, we leave a trace on a database. He says Hashem is on record in London. Well, he's shown up quite a lot on a database that records financial transactions to a tower block. And he's shown up over a range of dates. The most recent one was in May of this year. That's fantastic news. We've got a very current address, May this year. Well, yeah, it's sort of great on the surface, but it, it's not as good as it looks on the face of it. The block in question's got over 100 flats in it. It's a multiple occupancy building and there's no number. So he may have been using it as a drop address or as a credit address. What do you mean by a drop address? Well, a drop address is an address that, that they can use to receive things, but it's an address that's, that they're not actually at. They're not living there or anything. The chap might, he may never go there at all. He might go there once a year. Acton, West London. The residents don't know Hashem. Do you recognise that person? No, mate. None at all? No. And do you live here? Yeah, I've been here for, since 1985. I haven't seen him. here a long time. I doubt we'll ever find Hashem here. He doesn't seem to be using this location as a home, despite the evidence of financial transactions. Yet Hashem's apparent return trips to Britain and Ahmed Orled's escape to Djibouti raise serious questions about border security. How can men wanted for serious crimes seemingly come and go from the country with impunity? The answer, according to one security expert and former employee of the CIA, is there's little chance a wanted criminal would be stopped at the border. The odds on a criminal, let's say he's a, a, a man who committed murder, the odds are very little that somebody's going to be looking at every passport coming through Heathrow or coming through the, the Channel Tunnel or coming through one of the ferries to see if that's the guy. Because I find that astonishing. Most people will be shocked that passport doesn't get picked up and you get arrested when you come into the country. You may even have a flagging system, but if the country doesn't put the information into the database, the flag's not going to be triggered. The Home Office told us that the UK border agency does stop wanted criminals, but it can only act on information provided by the police. Just as I seem to hit a dead end, I tracked down one of Hashem's former associates. Hello, it's Mark from ITV. The man who insisted on remaining anonymous told me that Hashem used to work in the visa section at the Saudi Arabian Embassy in London. Apparently, after the crash, he fled to Egypt and is now living in Cairo. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Bye bye. Cairo, Egypt. Ancient sites, ruins and buried somewhere in a population of almost 7 million people, bail jumper Yahya Hashem. No doubt safe in the knowledge that there's no extradition treaty with Britain. But in an affluent suburb of the city, we found the Hashem family home. 
Despite staking out the property for several days, we never saw Hashem. A neighbor suggested he appears very infrequently. This unfortunately is as far as we can take our hunt. We've passed our information on to the Foreign Office. Whilst the Hashem Trail has gone cold, Daniel Slater is in my sights. South End, late afternoon. With my new lead about Slater's hiding place, I'm joining forces with South End Police. We are now mounting a joint operation. The plan is, is that we take him from that address when he leaves, and hopefully he will leave at some stage today. Um, and then hopefully you strike, take him out. He's wanted on a recall to prison for robbery. I expect him to run. OK? OK. After tracking Slater through Facebook, then trying to get him to our modelling sting, now we might finally confront him. So we're sat just around the corner now. We believe he's living in an address just up the road. And so hopefully, as he walks down, we've got loads of units parked around. We've got people in situation ready to cover him when he walks down the road. And at the point we call strike, we're all going to go. There's someone just, uh, oh, it's difficult for me to tell. I think it's a male, single male, now stops. The people just walking past now with a pink top. There's a person with a pink or red top just walking past now with a small child in green. Slater is sighted. Blue jeans and a hoodie. Yeah, he's walking up the other side of the road. Other side of the road, let's move back. Move back. That's him, that's him, that's him on the right, on the right. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go. He's going to see us, he's going to see us, he's going to see us. He's on his hand. Get down, get down, get down. Can you get him? Right now, the officers are going to get him now. They're going to get him and I'm going to jump on his back. You've seen him, you've seen him, seen Go, go, go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Go, go, go. He's gone, he's gone, he's gone. Before he can be arrested, Slater spots an officer. Top right. and jumps a seven-foot fence, leaving everyone in his wake. Where's he come out there? How did they lose him? How did they lose him? Jumping out of the Jumping out of the fence. Is there any available units? Deputy 4114, Deputy 414, sir, subject to radar. Right, you see him? Come over. 1, 2, 3. The building the other side of that block. Yeah. For 10 minutes, confusion. Then, a sighting. Member of the public see him go that way. Something's going on at this block of flats over the back here. Quick, quick, quick! Quick, quick! OK, he ran over the fence, jumped over the fence. We possibly followed him up here. We've got an address here where the curtain went down. The police have now shouted to him, come out. He said he's going to come out. They're just going to go and put the door in now to see. I'll stay outside. Please, dog, open the door. Yeah, let's go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. 
Where is he? Where is he? He ran in here. We've got a spotted. He's just putting his cuffs in. He has been arrested. Daniel Slater, who ran over the fence, has now been arrested. Police officer is going to bring him out very shortly. Got him? So, Daniel Slater, you won't be surprised that we are from ITV television and we've been following you for a period of time now. And as a result of that, that's why we caught you. I don't mind. I'll, I'll go back to prison here, because then I'll be off a licence. I'll be away from all this. They're, they're just on... They just want to rent your life. Why not just hand yourself in? Why not just say who we are? You know, I've done this. Listen, because they don't accept that. None of them accept that. You see this? So tell, tell me about them. Let's they hate back us. and they, they talk hate about us. Just tell me. our lives. OK, so tell me about them. Whilst you were on the run, did anyone help you? What do you mean help me? Did anyone help you, you know, hide, do stay I, away from... Do I get paid for this? Huh? Yeah. No, you're just going to talk to me. So, you know, you're giving your side, aren't you? You're giving your side. So when you're on the run, did anybody help you whilst you're on the run? What do you mean, help me? Well, hide from the police. They didn't. They didn't? So you I did it all, all yourself? Myself. All myself. So you're going to go back and serve your time, and when you come back, you're going to behave? I'll behave. I'm going to behave when I get out. I've got a girlfriend. I like her a lot. She's good. Does she know you're on the run? No, no one does. You don't go around telling people this. Right. But... And tell me, what spooked you today? Because, you know, we've been following you for a little while. When would this be on TV? Uh, Listen, I'm too good. A month I, or so I left 30, 40 of them. Did you know about Fort Bay? <laughs> Say left again? them behind. Left well, them behind. but you didn't today, yeah. though, did you? Yeah? Because actually, we saw you go over the fence and then we got you. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. I've done these a lot of times. I've been doing well for myself. You know, always be snitch. Yeah, all of you. Well, dogs. Serve yeah. the rest of your time. And I one day someone yeah. comes to see you. Well, they won't, Daniel. <laughs> Convicted robber Daniel Slater's three-month stint on the run has just come to an end. Alongside Southend Police, I tracked him down. Now he's going back to prison, but he's defiant. I'll do it. I'll accept that. I'll do this. Do yeah, I can do jail, piss, yeah. piss easy, go in Chelmsford, hey, man. So you can be Chelmsford people. And I've got mates there, I'll go there, just chill out for ten months and I'll come out. And then I'll do my thing. And but if you come out again and, and you do something and say they recall you back to prison, would you do the same again? Would you go on the run again? Every time, yeah. Slater's disdain for prison underlines one of the major reasons why so many criminals go on the run. There seems to be little fear of the consequences of getting caught. 
Facebook queue now, so what's your name, surname? Slater. Slater? First name? Daniel. Hello, Hello. 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 Slater was returned to prison for eight months after breaking his license. Essex police say his capture was a major coup and has already reduced crime. I was off that weekend and actually was in bed Saturday morning and I got a phone call from the team here to say, oh, you'd be pleased to know that Slater's sort of sitting downstairs in our custody. In relation to the crime in Southend, how significant is Slater to that? We do have intelligence that suggests that he was working with others um, and actively involved in burglaries at the moment. So for us, he was a clear target. And since his arrest, the numbers of burglaries have uh, dropped off within our area. A week after Slater was caught, his sister Natasha agreed to an interview. She told me she was desperate for her brother to change his ways. Hopefully, I can't put a 100% finger on it, but hopefully for the family and everyone else, everyone don't want to see him in there. We don't want to have to spend all our weekends and go out to visit him or speak to him over the phone. We want him here with us lot. With 25 offences in 11 years, Slater's criminal record doesn't suggest he'll listen to his sister. The net is also closing on bail jumper Ahmed Oled. He's been on the run for three years, at one point escaping to Africa. Now he's back in London and he's fallen for our cyber siren, Sally Ann Hogan. But we have less than a week to catch him because he's about to leave for Holland. Sally Ann suggests another date, this time with a sweetener. I was going to say, Sunday I have tickets for Arsenal from my Arsenal? dad. Arsenal? That's my team. It's here at Waterloo. Waterloo Station, 2 p.m. Sally Ann waits. Ann waits. Oled finally calls. He's late. One hour and 45 minutes after the agreed meeting time, a man emerges from the gates. All led. Convicted for violent assault, three years in hiding, now dawdling across Waterloo Station. He calls Sally Ann. She beckons him. But before their romance can flourish, He's nailed. Buried at the bottom of a pile of officers. Bail jumper, Ahmed Orled. I'll tell you, my name's Mark, I'm from ITV. We've been following you. Can you just tell me why you've been on the run for so long? I had some problems, so um, I wouldn't know if I would make it, so I had to hide that for a little bit. We've been on the run since 2008. It was, not, it was not about the police, but it was just about some people, some persons. That's why I went. Well, I was going to have myself in tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah, I, I spoke to my lawyer. Um, he told me he was going to give me a phone back. You know? He was giving me a phone back. I'm still waiting for his response. But you've been working there with yes, that Navy base. Been. That's very cheeky, isn't it? I was working, so I, I'm done. I'm done with all that stupid. It was, it's all in the past, you know. But how I've about everything? How do you feel sorry for the person that you have? I feel, I feel very sorry for the person. I yes, I did. Yes, I do. But it was not my intention to do it. He basically, I tried to stop it. And he, he, he punched me. Just, just tell me how you've managed to stay on the run for so long. No more, no more, no more. Orled was given an extra three months punishment on top of his original five and a half year sentence. The police were thrilled with his capture. Extremely pleased, you know, obviously because we put that, all that effort in and, you know, it was what, nearly four years ago now, three or four years ago. And then I got a text message from my governor just after four o'clock to say that um, he'd been arrested I must admit, my wife wondered what was going on because I was whooping and, and such like and punching the air. So a good result, 
two out of three criminals in custody. But my investigation was not just about cuffs and captures. It has exposed the scale of this problem. I've seen how the police lack dedicated resources, that official statistics are rarely reported, that some wanted criminals escape the country with ease, that some offenders have little fear of the law, and that it requires real graft and a bit of imagination to catch these fugitives. That's why, right now, there are thousands of wanted people on the run.